This is David Rawlings, founder of the London Longsword Academy and a swordmaster with over 25 years experience. Today we're showing him gameplay from Star Wars Jedi Survivor to get his take as a qualified swordsman and, more importantly, a Star Wars nerd. Oh, I'm gonna have so much fun choosing how to put my lightsabers together. And be sure to watch to the end of the video to find out how you can enter our giveaway and be in with a chance to win some very cool prizes. Right, over to David. A Jedi. So all these sweeping movements, they're absolutely fine. They're basically, they're along cardinal lines of fencing. So usually you have kind of a vertical line or a steep line, which we'd call something like a fendente or a parta. Diagonal lines, absolutely. Wrath, squalambratos, this kind of thing. Horizontal lines, tondos. Really, really obvious, simple things. So all of this is absolutely fine. One-handed, two-handed, doesn't really make much difference. I always worry about a little bit about how much the lightsaber techniques tend to be very, very wide, very, very sweeping. It's not a problem with having wide sweeping moves. They very much keep opponents at bay. You can get reactions from your opponents. In general, you kind of want to keep your point a little bit more focused on the opponent and then still make these smooth, same movements according to what they're doing. If you're fighting against multiple opponents, slightly different. You might want those movements of clearance to face onto another opponent. And then when you're cutting somebody, yeah, go for it all the way through. So there's actually something I really like about Star Wars games in general is that there is that feeling of wanting to slice through something. So there's a real commitment to the strike. You might take more time disabling them from being able to fight back against you a little bit first. So there'd be a tendency to maybe cut little bits off them until their arms dropped and then you can go for the big finish. Going for a deep kill is very, very dangerous. There was a nice little point where there's a suppression of the blade or an engagement of the blade from underneath. Usually if we were doing any form of fencing, if somebody was on top of our blade here, we'd hold up against it so that we know what they're gonna do. We don't wanna just attach our blade underneath because they'll probably hit us through the face. So you have this little moment of engagement where you're waiting and you'll either push their blade aside or you'll wait for them to attack and push them back over to the other side and then re-attack from that point. So yep, that's good. That technique has been consistently great through all of the Jedi games. <laughs> So this is a hideously, hideously inefficient way to fence against somebody who's got a shield. Basically hitting somebody who's got a shield directly in front of them gives them the distance to hit you straight off the bat. So if you can basically just block something and stab with it at the same time, any single time attack that your opponent gives you, which is basically they hit you, you can block and stab them more or less at the same time. So it's not a useful way really of fighting against someone with a shield. People like Tebow, for example, and Cavendish will in general use the shield against the opponent. You'll tend to attack either the head and the leg at the same time, or the leg to bring the shield down, then attack the head. Something like this, you'd probably try and use the shield to inhibit the use of the weapon arm so that as your shield is forward, it means the sword is backwards and it means that the sword has reduced reach. Ah! And that's closer to Tebow. So <laughs> anything where you can get the opponent to pull the shield forwards in order to defend them basically starts exposing this side. So if someone brings the shield in front like this, this keeps their sword weapon distance. Even if they try and stab over here, it's a little bit of a problem with them. As long as you can get to that outside, as long as you can hit them kind of here, that's good movement. And that involves moving around the opponent in order to get the action. That's good. When we're talking about Girard Thibault, we have basically two different ways of dealing with this. So if the sword comes forwards at all, depending on how the sword comes to us, we either want to be on the outside of this, which makes things easy because the shield's not so usable to us, or to be on this side of the sword, if the sword is in this profile, to try and walk the sword away from the opponent's shield. So we're trying to take it away from their ability to defend. To defend. Or if they push the shield across for any reason to deal with the sword here, now we want to go away from the sword we're using that to become a hassle to this. So if you block this with your shield, proper block it, there you go, makes it harder for you to do the thing with your sword. See, that's simple. So if I'm using two swords, very often what I will try and do is I'll try and do a sweep that does two things. So I'll have a sweep in effect that gives us a Tahoe and a Revez, and then I'll clear, okay? So we'll have a one here and then a two. So twice we're hitting high and low, and then we're hitting high and low again. Thus, we're taking away the utility of the shield in effect, because you have to defend two things at once. Does that make sense? If you drop that, you're getting that one. If you do the other one, you're getting the other one. Okay, so in both cases, we have two attacks, 
two attacks. Yeah? Okay. I think if you're going up against shields with a light taper, it really depends on what material it is. If it's cortosis, and I think it's in Shatterpoint they first really start using it, is the idea that it will short out a lightsaber. So that's absolutely superb. You've got a moment where the lightsaber doesn't work. If they were doing that, then that would be great. Clearly they're not in this. So I think functionally it becomes the same as any other sword and shield or sword versus shield style because you've got a shield which is capable of stopping a lightsaber and you've got to work around that. So pretty much the same as any form of swordsmanship. So of course, one of the best things that any has any kind of Souls-like mechanic to it, anything where your primary way of staying alive is dodging out of the way of everything and maintaining distance has got to be seen as a good thing because everything relates to the distance between you and your opponent. If you can move around them, great. Cavendish talks about literally trying to get behind your opponent and then says they won't let you or they won't suffer you to do so. But that's your plan. If you can do it, you always take away their advantage or you take away their advantage more so. Nearly every single sword system, there's very, very few that don't, will generally move to one side of the opponent. There's very few purely linear systems. So that movement around your opponent to gain advantage, to gain uneven angles, very, very important. Like I need backup to kill you. I always think we're a little bit unkind with double-ended lightsabers as well, because it's very, very common for pole arms to have effectively two ends to them. So although you'll have the primary end, which is gonna have the big weapon on it, be a spear, be it a halberd, or whatever kind of weapon, you'll quite often have at least a spike on the other end of the weapon, which means that both ends have facility to injure somebody. Usually people end up using it like a pole weapon, and that is really, really fairly standard. Lots of striking, lots of looping. You might turn it over the head and swap hands, but that's an easy place to swap hands because it's symmetrical. And then you just go back to using it like a standard one-bladed halberd, effectively. Again, it's one of those things, it seems an awful lot like a vanity project a lot of the time. And again, still have that capability to use something. Whether it's useful, that's a different thing. So it's an interesting thing when you go from the two-handed lightsaber being a pole weapon to being a two-handed sword, effectively. Fundamentally, you're using it in a very, very similar way. You've still got the two hands hanged, you're still hitting, you're still hitting, and you might spike occasionally, you might strike with the back end, but predominantly, you're using it very similar to the way that you would a longsword. And this, with pole arms, is not untrue. And then it's really just about how you manage that extra length around your body without injuring yourself. Back with your boy. So from a sword pedant point of view or from a Renaissance martial artist point of view, as soon as you start having enclosed environments, you get a lot less swinging. You get a lot more point work because you're trying to move around quite narrow things. So for example, if we have a narrow alleyway that we're trying to defend with a really big sword, such as one that I have at the back, you won't try and sweep it. There's no point. You'll just end up with your sword absolutely snared up on hitting walls and all kinds of things. So it's very much a stab someone that way, roll against the wall, stab someone again, stab someone again. So you'll literally turn against the walls, making sure that your point is going towards the opponent, but it's not a swinging. And that requires one, a high ceiling, and two, a willingness to recognize that there's always going to be these obstacles that are going to basically leave you open should you strike them. Generally, our principle would be as much as possible in an environment like that to keep everybody over one side. So you'd go along almost like a human typewriter, just going like this one, this one, this one, this one. No, you stay over there. So there's a constant awareness of the people trying to get past you, and you have to stop that as much as possible so you can keep all of your opponents focused into one area and try and press them. So it's kind of like sheep dogging. The idea of driving your opponents in one direction so they're manageable. Don't let them round behind you. So deflecting arrows or bolts. I like to think that if you're gonna try and do anything like that, you've got two primary ways of doing it. One is to stick the sword out, but the most important one is to not be where it is when it comes towards you. There's certainly things where you can try and deflect thrown spears and that kind of thing. But again, I would suggest that primarily getting out of the way is your safest way of doing those things. I think this is the thing is whenever you're dealing with anything to do with Jedi, you're not dealing with people who are using normal capabilities. So their inherent ability to put their lightsabers in the right place is kind of connected to more to the force rather than to an actual, oh, I'm timing this and I'm catching you like this. It's 
kind of an understanding of where the opponent's pointing before they shoot the gun and that kind of blaster and that kind of thing. I think within the context of the universe, it makes sense. Sometimes when we're talking about lightsabers, I, I have this slight obsession as to whether their ability to absorb impact is consistent, because sometimes people are just kind of redirecting bolts back at things without any effort. And then sometimes you have to bat it back like it's a tennis ball. That kind of affects how you think about how you have to move the opponent's sword out of the way. So if a lightsaber is very, very good at absorbing kinetic shock, which the implication is that it can do with blaster shots and the implication that it can do with sword shots. You don't actually, if it's similar to a metal sword, you don't have to move the thing out of the way. They're really, really good at absorbing shock without being flung out of the way. So it's in just a, a semantic point and I, never, I don't think it's dealt with consistently within the, uh, the canon of Star Wars. Get that droid back. So really, in any paired weapon style, there's not usually as much difference as you might imagine. Again, a lot of these things are situational. When you're dealing with one opponent, you want your point on as much as possible. Not too much difference between that and sword and dagger and sword and buckler. The reach of the weapon affects their interaction with each other, so you have to move them slightly differently. This is nice. Someone has been looking at their Godinho. You can tell that somebody who's done this has absolutely looked at Godinho online and has tried to work out what the things are doing. So the action where you're driving high and low with the sword and then double crossing, these are absolutely something you'll see in Godinho. Yeah, someone's been watching Godinho. I would very, very strongly suggest that this is not even somebody who's just been taking lip service. I think there's somebody who's actually watched Godinho work. So, yep, that's a good thing. I'm very happy with that. Jedi. I like that. The idea of just using the weapon singly and holding the other one back when you don't need to use both, absolutely superb. Hold one in reserve and watch for your opening. Good. Always room for spinning attacks. If you think about this logically, this is one of the things that Girard Thibault talks about. The idea of a spinning attack is really relative to where the opponent's blade is. So any action where you're bringing in your left shoulder, for example, it may be safer just carrying on and continuing that motion into a full spiral. This is referred to as a technique called the tornado. And Thibault certainly uses it, this idea of circling in with the blade in order to finish your opponent. And the idea being is that you might think that that exposes your back, but what it does is it keeps you safer for longer and allows you to get closer to the opponent before you finish them while their sword stays out extended. Hey, Cal, hold on. I've had this since I started freelancing. It's gotten me out of some bad situations and I figured it might do the same for you. So you may be thinking, does HEMA, the discipline I practice, have a, a pistol manual for sword and pistol? Yes, it does. I believe it's Pringle that does it, which is, I think, boarding cutlass or possibly spadroon and flintlock, if I remember rightly. Oddly enough, when you're doing pistol and sword, if I remember Pringle correctly, you actually hold the pistol in a reverse grip. So the pistol barrel will actually rest, rest down your arm. And this is a fairly consistent thing within um, various different assort, versions of swordplay. So in Iberian swordsmanship and Spanish swordsmanship, they talk about people having a piece of wood down their arm that they just use to block. And when you're using a pistol, very, very much the same thing. Just this idea that you're using the whole of the barrel to do this. I think particularly when you've got something which is only going to be used for firing once, that's really, really useful. The other thing which you may see in this is absolutely using your weapon to parry and then shooting them with the thing while you're doing it. Makes complete sense, very, very simple. And I think, again, that's Pringle. So you're kind of like, just parry, shoot, absolutely fine. So, yep. Now, when I was talking about fighting people in narrow spaces, this is very, very similar to what you would do. If you've got someone in a narrow space, you don't want to be swinging the sword all over the place. It's more about doing this so that you're controlling this narrow space, very much keeping your opponent at bay, and it's going to be harder for them to get around that point as well. So it makes an awful lot of sense. If you look at it in the context of this, you may well block with the other weapon and thrust or block with the other weapon and thrust with this, or in this case, shoot with the other thing. Cool, good. You also, as a fencer, may insist on using the point, but then what do you do when the point is set aside? It can mean that you have to disengage the blade in a much wider form. If you thrust at somebody and they get in close, you probably don't want to try and thrust them. You'll have to bring your hand back. It's going to be an awful lot of effort where you could just go like, oh, look, I've cut you, ow, and it's fine. I'm going to have so much fun choosing how to put my lightsabers together.
This is interesting. The guard he's using seems to be sort of like quite based on Achille Morozzo's Guardia Testa, I would suggest. Cool, a little bit Montante-ish. Ah, now there's an interesting thing. This suggests to me that again, somebody has been watching Montante rules. So the reason that generally you make this sweep if you are doing it with a montante rather than a lightsaber, you would kick the bottom of the sword. And it's really to get it in movement so that you can carry on and do a swing from a cold start. So if you think it's kind of like your quick draw, but with a montante, it's difficult to get moving when the point is down. So you give it a kick, that spins it into play, and then you crack on with it. So I would suggest again, somebody has been looking at montante rules online in the same way as somebody has been looking at Godinho's two swords online, which is a good thing. I am happy about this. The thing that I dislike about this, however, is the idea that it has drag, but it also has weight. If it has weight, then it should have flow. And if it has drag, then it should have drag. I think this is also possibly to do with what they've watched and the idea of making these sweeps very, very dramatic. And you can make these sweeps very, very broad because again, quite often we're herding groups of people or we're trying to keep areas at bay, this kind of thing. But again, you want to be in control of the weapon as much as possible. The bigger the weapon, the more you set it aside so you have to recharge the movement again, the more trouble you're gonna have defending yourself with it. You can make quite refined movements with this and refined is relative, but you don't need to kind of yank it. You really only want to be stepping towards the opponent as far as you can reach them with the weapon fully extended. You don't wanna be standing toe to toe, swinging the thing from behind you. It's not particularly good use of, of space. You're trying to keep people at a distance. And that's one of the reasons you got such a frickin' big sword in the first place. I'll catch every blow. Now, Montante, you absolutely, absolutely can spin with. I'd suggest you primarily spin from the other side. So there are very, very much reasons for spinning. And this, fundamentally, is to get along the weapon, maintain the cover as long as possible, keep the cover going, striking. So the first thing I'm going to do is quite simply from here, I'm going to strike the weapon down and then I'm going to wheel the whole thing around covering and then I'm going to try and hit you. So the idea of this is being that we have an application for spinning because here it's safer for me to keep the weapon down for that brief moment. I tend to like to do a, a double cover as I go in so that as I come from this point and I strike that as I'm going in, I'm gonna try and cover this again before I go. You don't need to, you can just take a much, much more prosaic view of just striking this down and absolutely hefting. I prefer a double cover, okay? So particularly if we take this from the point of view if you're jabbing out, so if you slowly extend the spear out for me, just towards the face there, okay? Now I have more distance to cover. Now I have a reason to cover your sword as I'm going through. Now I have a reason to finish. So you see, the more extension we have from your initial attack, the more I have to pursue the whole action going backwards. So again, if you jab out for me, one, two, three. So one of the things I noticed in some of this footage, and I don't know if it's a consistent, doesn't seem to be, but sometimes when you cut on a horizontal plane, you get a vertical plane in the cut. That really, really bugs me. Yep, yeah, horizontal blow, vertical. That bugged me. <laughs> so turning off of lightsabers is a really, really interesting thing. It has some really, really important ramifications. So absolutely, if you're going towards an opponent and you have the potential for them to block, the equivalent would be to withdraw your hand and then go back in. So obviously you don't have to do that. You don't have to withdraw the hands. So it has a very much positive aspect if you're going against someone who is fencing very, very defensively. You could absolutely utilize this um, to disengage from one side, change through from one side and attack them on the other. Disadvantage could be regarded that as you turn it off, if your opponent is more offensive, then what you've done effectively is you've still withdrawn your ability to defend yourself. So if somebody was in the habit of pursuing every movement back into guard, for example, you could say that the same repercussion is gonna occur if you turn the lightsaber off. So in the process of you turning it off, they're hitting you as the blade goes, but retracts in effect. It has historical context, even though it's done in a different way. I think the edge alignment thing is annoying, and I don't mean the edge alignment as in which way is your lightsaber facing, but if you're cutting something horizontally, surely it's gonna leave a horizontal line through something rather than the thing doing that. 
So that, that bugs me, but otherwise it looks absolutely awesome. It amuses me that it seems clear to me that somebody has been watching videos of historical swordplay, which is lovely. I think there's gonna be a lot of people who really, really want to crack into it. And again, so much whenever we're looking at combat in games, obviously there's so many difficulties in creating the idea of blocking and parries. But in general, you have to create that through your own awareness of the environment and your willingness to go, well, obviously I have inhuman resilience in this game to a degree so I can get away with doing all this stuff or you can go for this sort of like the one life attempt and just try and keep your distance and if you do that then you'll start using those sweeps and things in a more historical way because you're using distance so I think it looks beautiful impressive next time you want to pick a fight you go through us before you click away, I'm another Dave, and you may remember me from such hits like the voiceover from the beginning of this video. I just wanted to remind you all to be sure to check out the pinned comment below for a chance to win a selection of very cool prizes. This giveaway is happening all week across GameSpot shows, so make sure to check out all of the offerings across the week, such as the Kurt Locker, Spot On, and Firearms Expert React. The giveaway is available to US residents only, so there will be some terms and conditions that'll apply, but either way, best of luck, and thank you once again for watching.